Michael Green is an architect. When his son was young, they decided to set themselves up for a challenge, to kayak the seven continents. This was their last one, Antarctica. You know, we're in our kayak, but penguins jumping and whales around us and icebergs all around, and it's the most spectacular place I've ever been in my life. Just the intimacy with the landscape and the power of being in a kayak with ocean swells with, you know, minus two degrees South Celsius water, so that's like 30 degree water, and that'll kill you. And then you look around, and on the opposite side of the peninsula, a huge chunk of the ice shelf broke free. It was like the size of Rhode Island. And you feel, you know, with your 10-year-old, this, like, responsibility to their well-being. And, you know, that responsibility, you know, to keep them out of the water at that moment was in many respects in my mind, you know, equal to the responsibility of thinking about the idea that my son someday or my daughter might be sitting in a kayak in the same place and be staring at bare rock instead of ice. And then it's a product in large part because of my industry. You know, that changed me a lot. So Michael Green came home and shifted the focus of his architecture firm to work against climate change. I'm going to make this a focus of my career. I'm going to try to do better. And he did. Today, Michael is one of the world's leading experts on building skyscrapers out of wood. Welcome to City of the Future, a podcast from Sidewalk Labs. Each episode, we explore one idea or invention that could completely transform our cities. I'm Eric Jaffe. And I'm Vanessa Quirk. And today on our show, we're exploring the innovation that will make wooden skyscrapers possible. Mass timber. This is the world's tallest wooden building. The tree is the tallest Tokyo wooden building. Tokyo may soon be home world. to the world's tallest wooden skyscraper. 10 stories high. 14 stories high. 18 stories. Rock Commons will be the tallest wood building in the world. Tall wooden buildings. They're happening all over the world. But why now? After all, wood is one of the oldest building materials around. So to understand why, we have to go back in time. All over the world, there were big city fires a century ago. We didn't really have fire standards back then. Most of the cities in the U.S. and Canada, they had a great fire that completely changed the nature of the city itself. You know, often what was happening is windows of one building would face windows of another, and the fire would leap out one window into the other. So this was also a time when cities were booming. People were moving from the country into the city because of new factories and new jobs. And so we were building really, really fast. But we definitely didn't want these buildings to catch on fire again. And so we just kind of abandoned wood and moved to steel and concrete and assumed that was the only path forward. And we're realizing now that the mistake we've made has obviously had a huge impact on climate change and using materials that are massive energy consumers, and we could have done something, you know, with a renewable resource like wood instead. Hello, hello. Welcome. Welcome to the makeshift podcast studio. Kareem Khalifa is an engineer who spent his career pushing companies to innovate the way they build. Fittingly, he's now the director of building innovations here at Sidewalk Labs. And as part of our Sidewalk Toronto project, he's been working with Michael Green to bring wooden skyscrapers to life on the Toronto waterfront. Okay, so yeah, I never know the right word to use when we're talking about this. So is it mass timber, tall timber? I use tall timber. Michael Green, who's an expert, says mass timber. Mm -hmm. So I think I should do what Michael Green does. (laughs) Talk about a new industry. The people who are working in it don't even know what to call it. That's really great. (laughs) We don't know the words yet. Part of it, by the way, may be because this whole industry was not started in English. Oh, good point. (laughs) Mass timber started in the 1990s in the timber regions of Austria and Switzerland. Kareem recently took a trip there. And, and we went all the way up to this area, region of Innsbruck because there's a construction company named Romberg. Um, and they're very, uh, you know, they're deep into their industry, I would say. Yeah. Like, just like super nerdy about it, you mean? Really nerdy. <laughs> <laughs> the folks at Romberg took him out to one of their buildings so we could see Mass Timber in action. And so we drive up to it, 
Um, so, you know, high hills, mm -hmm. steep hills, you know, and uh, lots of snow. And so you have this view of a re rectangular building sitting over the water. Mm -hmm. And part of the building is actually on stilts. Um, so it's actually almost cantilevered into this reservoir. And we assembled the building in 30 days, working days in six weeks. And you walk up and of course you're, you're greeted by two giant wood doors. And as you look around, everything has been done in wood. Almost wow. everything, I would say. The staircase was made out of wood. The floorings in wood, the ceilings in wood. Nice, really nice space. And then you have a 270 degree look across the lake. Big, beautiful windows, man. Wow. You know, it was kind of breathtaking, actually. If you go higher, this building, this tree system is designed for two stories. It's really, you can build three, four stories. Really nice. You couldn't walk into this building without a smile. These buildings are beautiful. Yeah. This isn't a big, tall, spectacular building. This is a five-story building that feels spectacular, right? Yeah. So, yeah, what is the innovation that makes this possible? I mean, is it what makes it different from just regular, normal wood? The, the natural piece of the wood it stands out, but structurally, it's really how all these panels are engineered and designed. There are columns going all the way up through each of the five floors, and those are cross-laminated. Uh, yeah, can you explain what that means? Like, what does it mean to have a cross-laminated piece of wood? So, laminating is taking two pieces and putting them together to create some new property. So um, the laminations that we see all the time is the window windshield of your car. So that has a plastic lamination in between two pieces of glass. Oh, I didn't know that. If it were to break, and if you've seen a, a broken windshield, it doesn't fall all the way through. It sits somewhere in the middle. So when we talk about laminations for wood is how can two pieces of wood help each other? Mm. So the, the strength of a grain is across the grain and through the grain. Mm -hmm. And each one of those pieces of wood that they're laminating is angled at a different direction. So we have strength in each direction. So by, by laminating, by sticking all these pieces of wood together in a factory, that's how you create the super strong wood. Yeah, when they're all mated together, you have all the directions that you need for that beam mm -hmm. to do its job inside the building. Mm -hmm. So yeah, what are, what are the implications for for the, the construction site and the construction industry? So manufactured buildings, mm -hmm. uh, there's a big benefit whether we manufacture them in any material, mm -hmm. um, reduce the amount of workers on the construction site and put more of them into a factory environment. Right. And then, and then once it leaves that factory and it does get to the site, it's just simple assembly at that point? So all those materials get stacked up they get identified, right, where they go. And then at the site, you have a crane with wood. It's going to be a lighter piece than some of the other pieces, so the crane is smaller. And those people on site, there's only a handful of them now, and they're assembling almost an entire floor of a building in a day. So, of course, there's not any cutting or anything like that on the site. You have less machinery, so you, make, you have less noise. You just have this crane putting the panel into its position. It's being fastened, usually using hand tools. You don't have dust. You're not grinding things down. You're not you know, making any of that type of uh, pollution on the, on the job site. And they go up really fast. Mm -hmm. So the people who, that neighborhood has to experience disruption for a much shorter period of time with less noise and less dust. A floor a day. I mean, I'm obviously not a construction worker, but that seems incredibly fast. Mm -hmm. And I mean, from what I understand from talking to Kareem, it's because it is like simple assembly. The construction worker knows this piece goes here, this piece goes here, and it's just sliding in like Lego bricks. Or like my Ikea furniture. Uh-huh, exactly. Except you don't need the really frustrating little tiddly bits. Yeah, I'm just kidding. I don't have Ikea. Okay. <laughs> All right, but how tall are we talking when it comes to these towers? Pretty tall. There's already one that's 18 stories in Vancouver. Um, and Michael Green thinks we could go super tall, like 100 stories or even the Empire State Building kind of tall. We've proven, actually, you could have built the Empire State Building entirely in wood at 102 stories tall. The entire thing could have been built in wood. Um, I can't even believe that. Yeah, so people can't, right? So, yeah. you know, we did it as a theoretical exercise because, obviously, 
No one's asked us recently to build that building, but it's cool to think that it could have been. The Empire State Building was part of the skyscraper race of the 20th century. So it's pretty neat that we're kind of entering our own skyscraper race of the 21st century. And according to Michael, the skyscraper race is actually pretty key, but not for the reason you might think. You know, we've been trying to encourage in ways the this kind of race for the top, right? This race for height. And when you see a building that gets built at, at 20 stories or 30 stories, it takes away the public's fear of 12 stories. It's easy to design and build these buildings, and they're totally safe. It's easy. What's hard is to change the public's perception of what's possible. More people are living in all wood buildings, including skyscrapers made entirely of timber. But critics worry timber buildings could go up in flames. Some fire experts are raising alarms. Fire experts are raising alarms. Wood could fuel an inferno that firefighters can't fight. Critics say it's the towering inferno waiting to happen. Everybody thinks they're the first person to come up with towering inferno. The towering inferno. Right, that movie from like the 1970s. It's out of control. They think that's the, the funny first line, right? And some people get super angry about the idea of building a wood building. The emotional response is just sometimes just so strong for some people, right? And you just have to remind people how fire works. Yes, wood burns, but everybody knows that if you take a big log and throw it on the fire and take your match and try to light it, that it can't, you can't get it to start on fire. And so we find ourselves just telling those stories, reminding people of basic science a lot. But much of our building code in cities is still based on an outdated understanding of wood. Ironically, there's no height limit on how tall you can build a steel or a concrete building, but most building codes still say you can only build a wood building this high or that high. And it's arbitrary. There's no science whatsoever. The numbers are totally made up by some group of people sitting in a room, picking a number out of the air. Um, and it's crazy. Many countries have adjusted their building codes to allow for tall wood buildings. Last year, China adapted its building code to allow for timber buildings up to 18 stories tall. But in North America, tall timber buildings often have to get a special exemption from the city to even exist. There should be no height limit on wood buildings in the building code. It should be determined by safety. And safety is determined by science and engineering. And so the politics of building codes has to change. And it is politics. It's lobbyists by one industry pushing against another. Ladies and gentlemen, a word from the President of the United States of America. Earlier this year, this is how the National Ready Mixed Concrete Association opened up their conference. Looks like the concrete holds up and the wood doesn't, right? Yep. Well, the wood is not holding up. Welcome to the 2018 National Ready Mix Congress. In case you missed that, it was a recording of Donald Trump in Puerto Rico Today, saying, forward, it's like the concrete is there and the wood doesn't hold up. The, state of our industry. the theme of the day was concrete is strong and reliable, and wood, unpredictable and flammable. Even if these buildings don't burn, they are loud, collapse, rot, and mold. We are the concrete industry, and yes, we want to sell more concrete. Cross-laminated timber, which most of you have heard of at this point, is another big threat to putting concrete first. So the concrete and steel industry in the beginning, I think they just thought, well, this isn't really a big deal because it's not going to go anywhere. And now it's going somewhere. Right now, every single six-story building made with wood leaves half a million dollars of this industry's money on the table. They also made an ad campaign called Build with Strength. It's certainly a fair statement to say that we understand concrete and what it's going to do under fire conditions better than we do cross-laminated timbers. You know, a few years ago, I was some numbskull talking about this stuff nobody agreed with, and this never happened to. Now they're actually holding conferences to deal with this reality that they're coming. But what would it take to totally transform the building industry in this way, to build entire economies around mass timber? For most of the construction industry, it has to be faster and cheaper. That was the case for the world's tallest wooden skyscraper, Brock Commons in Vancouver, which went up in only 70 days and cost no more than a concrete building would have. And of course, you need wood, which grows faster than you might think. This is hard to wrap your head around, but the North American forest grows enough wood every four minutes to build a 100-foot building. But of course, it's not just about how much wood you grow. It's about how you grow it. 
and the truth is if you source wood irresponsibly you know if countries um, just mow down their forests this is a terrible idea creating a responsible mass timber industry is possible but it will require a lot of convincing convincing that land could be far more valuable with forest than without it places like brazil who don't build in wood right now and where we think of deforestation being the big issue the value of the forest is less than grazing land and cropland if brazil instead had a, a building industry that was building in mass timber um eucalyptus trees grow to maturity in in brazil in 7 years those can be made into mass timber products you're you're talking about a crop then you're talking about a building material that's not a lot different than planting corn So, you know, we think that the building culture is the answer. If you build the building culture, you change the economics of the forest. But let's say we do it. Let's say we incentivize nations to invest responsibly in their forests and the construction industry starts to embrace wood. Then what? What would it feel like to live in a city of tall wooden buildings? It's um David Attenborough that talks about the idea that you know a small child will turn over a rock that they find and underneath one and look for the little slug or the little you know creatures living underneath it but that as we go grow older we we no longer are so prepared to turn over the rocks and find these creatures and we become more and more disconnected from the wilderness around us and therefore we don't develop public policy that's as connected to the wilderness and 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 nature around us and the only way we reverse that trend is by bringing nature back into the cities and reconnecting people michael envisions his kids walking around future cities and seeing nature everywhere plenty of parks green roofs plantable balconies and of course wooden buildings the one thing i'm most proud of though is the fact that we were told that this wood building movement would never go anywhere we were told not long ago I man 6 7 years ago we were still told this was a crazy idea and now we can clearly do it quicker than we ever imagined it's not it's not impossible and I'm, I'm, it's it's a good feeling to know that's true thank you for listening to city of the future a podcast from sidewalk labs your hosts are eric jaffe and me vanessa quirk This episode was produced by Kara Oler, Benjamin Walker, and Andrew Callaway. Mix by Sharif Youssef. Many thanks to those who helped us make this episode. Michael Green, Karim Khalifa, Eric Basick, and Claire Mullen. Our art is by Tim Cow. Our music is composed by Adam James Levine Arity. If you want to hear more of Adam's work, you can check out his band Lost Amsterdam at amsterdamlost.com. To learn more about Sidewalk Labs, visit our website at sidewalklabs.com where you can subscribe to our newsletter at the bottom of the page. See you in the future.